Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Media Ignores Trump's Declining Mental Status. The media scrutiny on President Biden was extremely intense uh, during and after the July debate with Donald Trump. Uh, there was a daily barrage uh, basically telling the, the public that Joe Biden was declining and he was declining fast. And not to say that wasn't true, but uh, the problem and the issue as I see it is, where is the media as it's reporting on Donald Trump's many years of declining status? And is that a fair uh, coverage of the media to do so? The media treats Donald Trump as a normal candidate. And if you've watched Donald Trump in the last 24 months, you know it's anything but normal. Yet the media tends to focus on the Democrats and certainly on Joe Biden, uh, on his, uh, his pauses and his, his inability to get out of you know, a, a sentence or two. Uh, that led to Joe Biden's withdrawal from the nomination of President of the United States for the 2024 election. And to discuss that, I'm here with my special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, and as always, my co-host, Jay Fidel. Morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Jim, Jay. Jay. Jay, to you first. Uh, do you see a disparity? And, and maybe the title just says it all. Do you see a disparity that the media has focused or has focused on uh, Joe Biden and it led to his re resignation uh, from the, the campaign versus the crazy things that we hear and, and see Donald Trump do in, in front of the camera almost each and every day. Well, I, I think the media has uh, treated them differently, different levels of coverage for a long time. And it has uh, ignored um, Trump's Michigas for the entire time he was in office before. And um, I think, you know, at first I thought, well, maybe the media is intimidated. Uh, and then I thought, well, maybe the media, you know, wants to have eyeballs and therefore profits. Um, and maybe it's part of that. And, and then, of course, I, I've come to the conclusion most recently that the media wants contention. And Trump wants to create a situation where there is contention. Remember his show, The Apprentice, where he really found himself. Uh, he found himself as a media person. He found himself as a reality show person. And he created contention in that show and the thought that it would bring eyeballs and his sponsors liked it. And it continued for several years. And it was, uh, you know, in a in a strange way, popular. I couldn't watch it because I didn't think it was rational. I think I thought he was uh, attacking people without any reason for it. It was strange. And maybe that strangeness uh, is what caused people to watch it. So fast forward. We got the same thing now. He understands the media. He wants the media to come and pay attention to him. He understands that if they pay attention to him, you know, spell his name right, he can have power. And uh, that's pretty much what happened uh, in the 2016 election. And that's the same playbook that he's using today. He's trying to get attention. Now, we speculated um, after the convention, that is the Democratic convention, that he would be looking for attention because she had all the attention in that convention. She was brilliant. And then we speculated that um, he would be looking for attention uh, after his failed debate. And um, he, he did. He did after the convention and he did after the debate. He's looking for attention. Now, you can say that that, that reflects a, a lack of mental acuity. You could say that that reflects some kind of pathology. But at another level, it's exactly what he wants. It's what he's always wanted. For a nar narcissist, you know, you need to have attention. To start with, I don't think we're talking about a, a, a guy who is losing it. In his own way, he's brilliant. In his own pathological way, he's brilliant. Now to your question. I, I think uh, the media doesn't understand this. The media doesn't understand the notion of projection, which we were talking about before the show. The media doesn't understand um, that they need to treat him special. 
Um, they want to have that contention that Trump wants them to give him. And they're doing it. And they're being sucked in. They're being sucked in to his program, to his narrative. And this isn't necessarily a matter of um, you know, not being fair or not, you know, being balanced. It's it's a matter of them being sucked in. He is manipulating them as he always has. Remember, when he was a real estate guy, he would call the press under a fictitious name and uh, and he would get attention that way. Well, it's the same thing here. So every time he loses, he projects and claims to win. I thought it was remarkable after he failed in that debate that the first thing he did is go to the spin room and claim to win. And he's been doing it ever since. <clears throat> he made a terrible mistake about the dogs and cats, but he drills down on that. He, he repeats it a thousand times and he has all his acolytes, including the worst acolyte of all, J.D. Vance, repeating it. So what I'm telling you is the press bites and I've written commentaries about this, and they're on our Think Tech uh, website. Um, the commentary that I most recently wrote and um, you know posted is that the, the press are are fools to accept this. They're fools to let him suck all the oxygen out. They're fools um, to let him do what he's doing, and they don't call him out. Sure, they make fun of him. They make jokes of him. And in their own way, they call him out for entertainment. This is not entertainment. This is real serious stuff. And I don't think the press is doing a good job. They should be blasting him to smithereens in their comment and their in their coverage. Well, if nothing else, Jane, I couldn't agree with you more. If nothing else, they should have learned the lessons of 2016 and 2020. And it just doesn't seem their memory has um, stuck around well enough to remember those days. But um, let's thank you, Jay. Let me move on. Chuck, I'm going to go down a quick list. And particularly the last three items will pertain to the debate with Her um, Kamala Harris. But let's just start the just a few examples. I mean, we could be here for an hour going through all the examples since 2015 with Donald Trump and his uh, his crazy talk. Um, let's remember that he was talking about a boat that was sinking and it had electric batteries underneath the deck and whether it was wise to stick with the boat for electrocution or swim out uh, five yards away where there was a shark. Uh, where does this stuff come from? I don't know. Um, his talk about Hannibal Lecter at, a, at many of his rallies. Hannibal Lecter. Uh, let's talk about windmills that cause cancer. Let's talk about, now going to the debate, um, his proclamation that the people of Springfield, Ohio, were eating cats, dogs, and pets. And then let's not forget some of the other things he said in the debate, which I thought was equally a uh, wackadoodle. Uh, he, he accused uh, Kamala Harris that she wants to do transgender operations on illegal aliens that are in prison. I don't think I've heard the, the press say one comment about this, this crazy quote from Donald Trump during the debate. Um, let's also look at the, the outlandish and actually ABC, uh, David Muir did say this, um, that they are killing newborn babies just after birth and they're destroying those lives. Uh, so these are just a few examples. Do you think the press, since the eating the dogs, cats and pets comment has shifted a little bit uh, to criticize Donald Trump? And is that criticism uh, directed towards uh, his mental stability? Flat no. To your question, okay. um, if anything, they have dug in, kind of like the MAGA supporters, to try and find. They essentially duplicate his strategy of projecting and distracting. Trump's a one trick pony and his whole team is one trick ponies. They've got a two sided coin, projection and distraction. Projection is putting your worst faults onto others, accusing them of what's worst about you, right? Distraction is using those accusations to distract from real issues, real important events, communications, and actions. That's all they got. And so when Kamala Harris, whose name Trump intentionally pronounces wrong, in fact, in his speeches now, when he says Kamala, he stops himself and, he said, and then he says Kamala. He is unintentionally aggravating 
person because he believes that works for him. Jay's point is really astute. He's been doing this for years. He got the feeling during the Apprentice TV show that being that attacking, aggravating, totally factually unsupported person was working for him. It was getting him attention. It was getting him leverage. It was getting him status. It was getting him power. And there were many Republican candidates in 2016, virtually all of whom not only thought, but actually said, oh, we're just waiting for Trump to self-destruct like Ross Perot did when he ran. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for them, because of exactly what Jay's talking about, because the media gave credence and support without questioning. There was no fact checking in 2016. And in fact, the commentator who fact nailed Trump in the debate on his allegation that Harris and Waltz were in favor of killing babies after birth, who was Lindsay David. I love the way that she dealt with him because initially David Muir was kind of taking Trump on one-to-one and Trump would say something that was wildly outrageously false and patently so, and Muir would come back with a factual assertion with evidentiary backup. Eh. Lindsay Davis saw that and saw that the better journalistic strategy, let the guy grab the mic when he's not supposed to have it. Let him hang himself. Wait till there's a space in his rant and then interject a fact that torpedoes everything he just said. She was really, really good at that. And she demonstrated that there is one thing, one kind of person to which Trump has absolutely no defense. He walks away and quits in abject failure. And that is strong, articulate women, mm -hmm. which calls attention to the fact that what we really need in authority is a strong, articulate women. Now we have that chance. Look at the difference between the DNC convention and the RNC convention. The RNC convention was all Trump. Nobody even remembers if anyone else actually said a word during that convention or what that word was, if they did. In the DNC, Kamala Harris not only shared the stage, she set the stage with Oprah Winfrey, right? <clears throat> with Kinziger with people who were incredibly articulate, incredibly factually well-founded, incredibly common sense based and oriented. She came up as the culmination and the leader of a team of people that Americans love to listen to and like. She offered the alternative. You wanna watch this TV show of, you know, uh, friends, uh, a bunch of white people, you know, bickering with each other about essentially nothing. Uh, or do you want to watch this other show where you get a diverse collection of really successful, thoughtful, articulate people presenting a common sense alternative to go forward? While I admire David Muir for, for calling Trump out, uh, and the same thing with Lindsey Davis, um, I'm not sure that was all that effective. It's more consistent with the way they do this with, with kid gloves. Um, I would have preferred, uh, without raising voices, without being argumentative, you know, at least in style, if Muir and Davis had said, um, Mr. Trump, that's not true. That's a false statement. And I suggest you know it's a false statement. Uh, if you want to correct your answer, you know, let them have it. Let them have it if it was uh, like it was a, like a cross-examination in court. But yeah. they're, not, they're not up to handling a guy as pathological as Trump. Yeah. So they don't have a ready way to go. And, and we, they haven't learned yet about how do you deal with somebody who is doing a blatant lie right in front of you. 
You know, I would have preferred another approach. You know, Jay, I was listening to other uh, journalists and they were discussing their role, like Donna Bash, I think was one of them, and a couple of others. They were discussing their role as a moderator during a debate. And a lot of them said, it's not my job to fact check. It's my job to ask the question and hear the response. And that's it. Now, I thought that was an interesting philosophy, given the fact that they're journalists and the number one tenet of their you know, society of professional journalism is to tell the truth or speak out when the truth is obviously not being spoken. And so um, I found that interesting that a lot of these, these pros that have been in the business for years felt it's not their job to follow up uh, during a debate. Uh, I don't know if they're worried about seeing biased, uh, if that was their concern, but uh, I certainly expect in the journalist to follow up and it, I don't think it's being done. And to your point, uh, yeah, David Muir uh, could have been a little more direct, but I was thankful that both of them actually did do a little fact checking right there in real time. Otherwise, we would have gotten another um, diatribe from Donald Trump and never caught on any of his foolishness. Well, and Jay's right for three reasons. And number one, it's available to a journalist. If you're going to ask a question, ask a tough question that the people are going to learn something from about that candidate. Don't just give them a softball question that lets them rant. Mm -hmm. Because that's the distinction between journalism of Trump continuing now, which are softball articles that don't question him and basically give voice to his rant. And what I liked about Lindsay Davis is hey, she'd let him go far enough out on the branch that it would break under his own weight. Hey, and then instead of saying crash, hey, she would invoke the law of gravity and watch it happen. Let me touch on a point that, that Jay made, and, that, and I, I have to agree, and that is the media is looking for eyeballs. However we get there, we get there. They're looking for their viewership, of course, and viewership means revenue because the advertisers love you know, viewership numbers before they place ads. Uh, let me throw by maybe just a theory that um, the reason we see sometimes one-sided, uh, I, I think Jay used the term once, uh, you know, death by a thousand cuts towards Kamala Harris, is that they want a horse race. They don't want one side or the other uh, running away with the poll numbers because who's going to engage and watch the media if it's a clear winner that's on the horizon? Uh, they want a horse race right up to the election day because that will generate more viewership, more revenue, more advertising dollars, more, 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 and more revenue. Uh, your thoughts about that, Chuck? You know, that's a really valuable insight, Tim. And I, I think that's a two-sided coin as well. One side of it is, of course, it is so obvious to everyone. Look at the international press coverage of the debate. That's not one-sided. It's an impartial assessment that the outcome was clear and decisive. It's an observation. It's a factual observation, but it is consistent worldwide. Mm -hmm. hey, compare that to ours. Our press is woefully deficient. They're not reporting what really happened. They're trying to mischaracterize it, not just for the personal gain of viewership, Look at who our press is. Look at where their resources, their money comes from. It's not just subscriptions. They are getting treatment in the press. And they need access to those figures. If Trump wins, they will have no access to him if they cover him objectively. He's made that crystal clear. Here's a guy who has said the press is our worst enemy, and not just Murdoch's Wall Street Times and Fox News and all that stuff. Washington Post, New York Times, virtually everybody except Daily Cause, Guardian, and Atlantic is falling all over themselves to so, kiss up to him so that they get access to him okay. and his team after this. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, is that they're softball questions, kid gloves, because they want to be in the press briefing room 
when the president of the United States is in there. I think that's a horrible reason for not doing your job as a journalist. Uh, but there it is. I think you uh, that's a great point, Chuck. Jay's point earlier, if it had been a press conference by Trump, uh, I think aggressive questioning, uh, direct debate with him by the reporter, by the journalist, it would have been appropriate. And we saw that. And we saw Trump walk away from strong, articulate women who stood up to him, challenged him with tough questions and factual observations uh, multiple times, not just once. But this was not that. The debate was to be between Harris and Trump. And I think, to me, what Lindsey Davis did and Muir eventually started to follow was the right thing, which was to let the debate be between the two of them. And Trump was going to take more mic time. He was going to interrupt. He was going to do that stuff. And with one exception, hey, Harris did not. She maintained a class dignified decorum throughout. That's part of what people watching got. The media can characterize it any way you want and any way they want. But ultimately, we all know what we saw is when Kamala Harris told Trump to his face, to millions, tens of millions of viewers nationally and internationally, Putin will eat you for lunch. The clear implication and inference was because I just did. And she did. Right. She right. manipulated the debate. She managed the debate. She orchestrated the debate in ways that played to her strengths and his weaknesses, and he went right down right the rabbit hole. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Uh, Jay, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. Uh, as you, since our last show, uh, there was an, another would-be second attempt of assassination of Trump uh, on his golf course, and as since that time, we've had both Trump and Vance blame. The Democrats blame Harris team for the use of language that they thought promoted violence. Isn't that hypocrisy or projection? But be as it may, there it is. Uh, I'm going to go down another list of, of things that they're, they're upset about. And that is, uh, they, they said it's not helpful for calling um, Trump a fascist. Uh, I think it was Anderson Cooper yesterday played a play on this segment. And he brought out 15 times where Donald Trump calls the Democrats and Harris uh, a bunch of fascists. They said that it's not helping them out by any comparisons to Hitler. Um, yeah, no one likes to make those comparisons unless those comparisons happen to be accurate, particularly on its uh, propaganda techniques. Uh, they called out uh, the Democrats for casting Trump as the end of democracy. Uh, again, I'll pine that, yeah, there are many things that he says and does, dictator for a day, for one, um, that the en enemy of the people is the press, uh, how he's going to jail his political enemies. These are things that kind of spell the end of democracy. And so he doesn't like that. And Vance doesn't like that. And so the question is this, uh, Jay. Will the media realize the hypocrisy and the projection that's going on here and will they, will they go back and, and highlight the years of his projection and his language, uh, his stochastic communications, and, and say, well, wait a minute, uh, we see something quite different here? Or will they say, yes, <clears throat> the Democrats and Harris team needs to modify and remove their, their words about Donald Trump being uh, the end of democracy or the, you know, the fascist tendencies that he seems to be uh, communicating. Which way will the media go on this? Well, I, I don't think they can legitimately say that, uh, that uh, Biden and Harris are making statements that evoke violence. They're not. They never did. It's so clear. Um, the question is more like, what should they say about, about all of Trump's uh, stochastic remarks? Um, and his suggestions and the uh, suggestions of his acolytes um, for violence, because he is clearly doing that. Now, once in a while, you see an article in the Times or the Post that suggests that that's what Trump is doing, and we should be uh, aware of it. 
But it is absolutely outrageous for them to uh, evoke violence, uh, absolutely outrageous for them to use this projection device and, and put their own gross remarks onto Biden and Harris. Um, and I don't think the press is making that clear. It's outrageous. And there should be at least a whole bunch of opinion pieces here and there and everywhere pointing that out. These guys are looking for a civil war. They're looking for assault rifles in the streets. Um, they're looking for as much school shootings as you could possibly have. Um, and they should be called out for it. It's It's been like that since his term originally began. It's been like that since the uh, the Central Park Five. He calls for violence all the time. And I don't think the press is doing a good job at pointing that out. And Trump is actually making progress because he is speaking to his acolytes and his cult around the country. And he is saying things that are untrue and outrageous and then putting them on Biden. So if you ask one of those guys that gets interviewed by a comedian at a county fair somewhere in the South, right? What do you think of Joe Biden? The guy will say without hesitation, he will say, Joe Biden is a fascist. Joe Biden loves uh, you know, racist and rapist immigrants. And he'll just repeat what Trump is saying. Uh, Trump is essentially getting away with it, that we need the press, we count on the press to call Trump out whenever he does outrageous things like that. And they are not saying that. They are not calling him out. And the problem is that Trump knows this. He knows how it works. He just puts it on the other guy. So <clears throat> I'm I'm very concerned that uh, th that the cult is strong. One of the reasons the cult has many tens of millions of people is that they're completely uninformed, and the press could do a much better job. Okay, great point, um, Chuck. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I want to read a quote from uh, J.D. Vance. And I will tell you that the Secret Service certainly caught note of this quotation. Uh, they're actually concerned about it. Uh, it goes back to stochastic language. And uh, we'll see if the media calls this one out. So far, they haven't. But let me read the quote to you. Uh, J.D. Vance said the following after the attempt uh, on the golf course uh, against Donald Trump. And he said the following. No one has tried to kill Kamala Harris in the last couple of months. And now two people have tried to kill Donald Trump in the last couple of months. I think that's pretty strong evidence that the left needs to tone down its rhetoric or someone is going to get hurt. Um, that's pretty stochastic. And again, I can see why the Secret Service is concerned. Uh, basically, he's saying it's their turn. It's hey. their turn for a hit. Uh, well. Should the media say, wait a minute. Uh, we've we've turned our attention on uh, the Democrats and the Harris team about uh, toning down their rhetoric because it's resulted, or at least they're reporting it, it's resulting in, in attempted uh, assassinations. Uh, is it time for the media to say, wait a minute, what about you guys? Yeah, I think there's a an excellent example in the debate of exactly what you're talking about and exactly where that perspective should be. And that was the moment in which Kamala Harris looked directly at Donald Trump, as she did many times during the debate, and said, wait a minute, people. Let's pay attention to what's happening here. The accusations that a career lifetime prosecutor who has devoted her public service entirely to defense and protection of the rule of law is being accused of not doing that by a convicted felon. Look at what we have here, right? Look at where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. That's what the media is not doing. And that's what we're talking about here. The media is not considering the source of the remarks, what it tells us about that source of the remarks. It is not mentioning when J.D. Vance says this, wait a minute, this is coming from the same people whose cult leader 
said, if I lose, there will be bloodshed. That's a direct quote. Yeah, it's a direct quote. Yeah. That is not violent rhetoric. Give me a blank break. Okay, so we have 50 days left. Does the media start turning its attention to, um, well, let's just go to the title of this show. Uh, Media ignores Trump's declining mental status. Do they start reporting on these wackadoodle things that uh, he says? And also the the stochastic, if not overt, language of J.D. Vance and Trump. Do they? We have 50 days left. Does that shift? Same question. Look who it's coming from. Look who the media is. You can't assume that this is an objective, democratically supportive, community-oriented media. It's not. Yeah. It has not been since my time, the 1960s when we actually got media who were objective, who would disclose truth, who would honor truth, who would serve the community and democratic ideals. We do not have that media now. There are a few beacons out there, Atlantic, Guardian, Daily Cause, a few others, but generally speaking, including New York Times and Washington Post, and the rest of those impugned so-called liberal media, they are not examining the source or the quality or the integrity or the character or the value of the attacks on Harris and Waltz and the Democrats. Look at who's doing it. Look at where it's coming from. Not just what do they have to support it, but what does it tell us about them? If you ever see the mainstream media in this country shift their focus, to what the words and actions of Trump and J.D. Vance tell us about them, then you may see a change in media truth orientation. Until then, ain't going to happen. Well, I hate to think that the media is uh, the kingmaker of presidents, but uh, seems to be moving in that direction. Uh, The movie Making of the President in 1969 suggests how powerful the media really can be. Uh, We're out of time, so Jay... Your last thoughts on this topic. They are kingmakers. Absolutely. That's a profound statement. And what they do between now and the election is going to have a huge effect on the election. Furthermore, um, you know, what we what we are going to see in the next 60 days, it's 50 days already, um, we are going to see more of the same. We're going to see the apprentice. We're going to see the same kind of what you call it, wackadoodle. It's not a question, you know, of Trump's lack of uh, of mental acuity. He knows what he's doing. And I mean, although I agree that, you know, he is losing mental acuity, these remarkable statements are not necessarily an example of that. They are an example of his psychopathology. Okay, the other thing is, I think the most profound point of this discussion is Chuck's point. These media are setting it up so that they can have access in the next administration, because without access, they can't have news. They can't be leaders in in the news business. They can't make money. Um, they, They will lose readership. And so they have got to have a plan for how to go down these 50 days without getting into a toe to toe argument with him and thus lose him if he wins. They have a plan A and a plan B, depending on who wins this election. And if it's plan B, and if he wins the election, they want to be there in those press conferences. They want to be able to stay alive economically. And that's the most profound point of all. It is. It's also why Kamala Harris gives so few press briefings. Why would you give the microphone to people who believe that the only way that they can preserve their profitable viability and sustainability is by supporting the guy who will only give access to those who visibly consistently support him? Everybody else gets excluded and attacked. All right. Well, let's let that be the last uh, message that we put out here today. And it's on a good one. And I, I think it's a little chilling to me that um, our media is not doing that which they were designed to be, and that is a disinterested, unbiased, 
and they ask the tough questions when they need to be asked. And I agree, that's that's just not happening because they're worried about their future and access to whichever president may be elected. So uh, I want to thank my special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, and I want to thank my co-host, Jay Fidel, for an engaging discussion. Won't you join us next week for American Issues Take One? I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and until then, aloha.